thanks again for, for having me here in uh, Milano. And yeah, as you heard already, we make a distinction. We do not call our patients patients. We call them wearers. Because life is changing and we have seen that um, in the past it was much more about having um, a therapy and maybe not decreasing the state of a patient or inpatient care. But nowadays it's much more about empowering those people so they can lead a life as they have done before. So in our case, well, as already mentioned, we are talking here about um, orthopedics. And um, I would like to just highlight in the 15 minutes I have today the three aspects of what we call is digital tailoring. So what are the three aspects? First and for all, um, I would like to highlight the fit. The fit is a very crucial part in uh, most of those so-called patient aids. Well, we do not call them patient aids also anymore. Those are really solutions. They are devices and they should be not something which you would hide away like you did in the past with, for instance, prosthetic legs or with orthotics, with braces you would wear under your trousers. But what we want like to have something which you are proud of. So first and for all, it's about fit, having the perfect fit. And I would like to give you one example here from our medical practice. So this is a halo system. I actually had to wear such a device myself uh, five years ago. So there are four titanium screws which are put into your skull and then around it is this halo-like, that's where the name comes from, this halo-like ring. And you're fixated either versus the body or in my case it was to undergo radio surgery and I was fixated to the machine. It's a very, very painful sensation. It also has high risks of infection and others. And uh, there are people who have to wear it for several weeks or even up to months because maybe of a fracture in the neck. So in my case, it was only for a day, but still it was very painful. And what we imagine should be the solution for this, or our physician actually developed this, is something really tailor-made or custom-made, which really fits perfectly. So this not only is better for going out and maybe feeling more comfortable with it. It's also about reducing a lot of the risks you have in stationary care in the hospitals today. Because here you don't have anything um, going into your skull or um, actually opening the skin, making an open wound. So there's far less risk concerned those devices. And it's also uh, much better in terms of, um, for instance, you have these, um, uh, we call it a decubitus or uh, you have those pressure wounds which um, come up after several weeks. But, well, let's maybe uh, skip this um, part and go forward about how we think this is going to work in the future to make something really tailor-made. In the clinical practice, we often have uh, CT data which might look like this and which we can segment so we get the patient anatomy. Then we have to correct the posture of the patient because usually when they do... CT or MRI imaging, they are not in the correct position. Then we can actually lighten the weight of such devices. Those halo fixator systems, they weigh several kilos, while our braces, they weigh only a couple of grams. In the end, of course, 3D printing might be a way to generate the design and bring it to life. This is not mandatory. We can also use other means. But automated fabrication is, of course, something which leverages this so that everyone in the world can profit from it. So we achieve a really lightweight, breathable design, which also has advantages, as mentioned before, in clinical care. Um, a second uh, thing I would like to stress is the fashion aspect. And while we are here at Design Week, so I'm not a designer, I have to confess. I'm an engineer by training, a biomedical engineer. Um, but, of course, design is something very, very important for acceptance. In clinical care, we call this patient compliance. A very broad term, but this is basically the acceptance of somebody receiving a medical device and then really using it. Because the best therapy out there is worth nothing if the patients do not accept it. And I think we will hear also a bit about this later on. Um, so one example, well, in the past, we were having maybe a wooden peg as kind of a solution for a prosthetic leg. And no doubt we have come a far way from this. We think nowadays a solution or a prosthetic leg should look somehow like that. So this is something really lightweight. Again, it's something which 
do not, does not hide away what we do not have anymore, maybe, as a wearer of a prosthetic leg, but it's more like a fashion statement. It's something like an accessory. This is very similar and comparable, for instance, to wearing glasses. In the past, actually, a glass, it's also officially a patient aid. Nowadays, really, there are hipsters and they wear glasses with, uh, without needing them, really, because, well, it's a fashion statement. And that's something we want to see also in other parts of patient aids, for instance, prosthetic legs. Um, and then the third aspect of uh, what we have seen here in digital tailing, which is very, very crucial, for instance, the uh, functionality. I mean, this brace, it's not really something we will see replacing the plaster cast in the next five years. So this is for sure because plaster casts, they still have their validity in clinical care. However, if you have to use this all your life because, well, you have some kind of disability or movement impairment, um, then this is something entirely different. You want to go out, you want to go swimming, and this was done for a patient who, for instance, went to holidays and he could dive, he could snorkel, he could go to the pool. So this is something, for instance, waterproof. But in functionality, it's also about some other aspects. For instance, when we look at the gate, so this is uh, Belinda from uh, the United Arab Emirates. She's living there as an expat for more than 20 years now. And um, she wants to use or to have a prosthetic leg which would carry her also the longer distance. Nowadays, um, prosthetic legs, they are usually either made for really doing sports. So these carbon blades you see at Paralympics, for instance, but they're usually not reimbursed. And then you might have a prosthetic leg which might work for everyday life and it's really to hide it more away, but they do not carry you several kilometers a day. And she wanted to take part in a walk for the rights of disabled people and uh, she needed something to really put her foot down to have a strong impact. So we created this very lightweight again bionic foot which really resembles a real natural foot. And that's something different because now, before us, usually a prosthetic foot would look like um, this very small carbon fiber blade and then inside um, a soft shell, which um, kind, uh, kind of is like ice skating a bit or inline skating. So it's a bit wobbly to the sides. You do not really have a proper um, sole down there. So this has changed when we mimic now the nature, which of course is still the best solutions. So do not take these as, okay, these are um, maybe, let's say, superhumans, these are cyborgs. No, we are still trying to catch up to what actually nature has provided us with. So we are still on our way there, and, but we are coming closer and closer with digital tailoring and the CAD tools we are today, thankfully, have in our hands. So this solution is uh, up and running since almost a year now. And it was the first fully 3D printed leg, which is medically certified in the world. So it consisted of a socket from a partner company. It consisted of this um, cosmetic device or this shell. And it consisted of a 3D printed foot, including, again, for energy efficiency, something like carbon or glass fiber spring inside. So these are the three aspects of what we call digital tailoring. And I would like to share one last story with you, which brings together all three aspects quite nicely. Um, we met Emma almost two years ago. So in summer 2016, uh, we met her and her parents. She encounters three major problems when she needed a prosthetic foot, because since birth, she is missing her left foot. Um, this is not Uncommon in Germany, however, we are quite lucky. We have very good prenatal care, so there are really few children born without a limb or with a deformed limb. But worldwide, we are talking about 65,000 children. So when she first came to us, she told us, well, first of all, I need a foot that really is in my size. And as there are so li little children in Germany who need such a device, luckily, um, the big manufacturers, they don't have this in stock, especially not in every size. If you go out there and go looking for a prosthetic foot for small children, you won't find anything. So we said, well, we can take this digital model we have of the prosthetic foot for adults, and we can just scale it down. And digital means 
if you just open the SOLIDWORKS tool. It's really easy to scale down. Of course, you have to think about some limitations, like a minimal thickness, for instance, of the material, but this is something you can incorporate in your designs. Um, the second part was, she said, well, when she finally had found a foot, she needed to accept it. Because, well, those feet, as I said before, they usually come in a soft shell, and um, we call this the uncanny gap. Maybe it's something you have seen in video games. If you go out there and look at uh, characters which are animated, they are almost human-like, but this is a bit scary. So we tend to shy away if something is almost human-like, but not really nature, natural or not really human. So to overcome this gap, we actually went away from trying to create this soft shell as natural-looking as possible, but we said, well, let's do something entirely different and just ask her, what's your favorite color? What's your favorite, uh, favorite animal? So horses and the color pink work much better than creating this almost human-like shell. Um, the last aspect was, well, when she finally had found a foot that fitted her, maybe it needed to be cut down, and that she accepted after, se after several weeks, then she quickly broke it because, well, she's a young, active girl. You can't tell her, well, with this foot, be careful. No, she just goes out there to kindergarten, jumps into puddles and breaks it because, well, those feet are not made to be waterproof or for very active children. So the solutions we created was first with coloring and asking her about her personal preferences. We managed to get acceptance on first sight and get a perfect size, which would enable a good physical as well as mental development because her gait could improve on this. Um, secondly, she's also much more confident in going out, and now she's rather complimented by her playmates than before pitied by them because, well, they, others come to her and say, well, I want to have such a pink foot myself. So from a black swan, we turned her into a pink princess. Last but not least, that's Emma. Uh, a year ago, or slightly less than a year ago, she had grown out of her uh, prosthetic foot. And what's good about digital tailoring is we could go back into history and look at, okay, this was her first foot. She needs a bigger one now. So we can already, by only getting maybe um, a measure of dimension, for instance, in the foot length, could scale up the version and provide her very, very quickly with a new version. Well, her taste had changed, so now it needs to be blue. But otherwise, it was very quick to go back into history and use the 3D file we once created, uh, alter some parameters, and generate a larger design. And again, also this red version for going out. So we replaced some screws with titanium adapters, for instance, to make it waterproof. So the three aspects we have seen today of digital tailoring we think this is really crucial to go out there and ask the wearers, what do you want? We are not the physicians, we are also not the orthopedic technicians or the prosthetists who treat them actually. We are just somebody who empowers those medical professionals to go out there and make a difference for all their wearers, their clients, or if you will say so, their patients. And this is something fundamental for us. We have seen that by our technology, we enable not only the lucky 1%, but really millions of people out there. Because I was talking about 65,000 children, but there are at least, well, there are different uh, estimations, but there are around 50 to 37 million people in the world who need a prosthetic device. There's an amputation happening every 30 seconds. And there are at least 100, some other estimations say 200 people who need a brace to work either by walking around or by having the manual needs they need for, for, for being mobile or being active in the world. So we want to empower all those people out there by those digital tailoring methods. And that's it. Thanks. Thank